is this is into the point here. Okay, let's go. So thank you very much, and thank you for the four organizers for inviting me to this uh, nice place. And the second workshop are very uh, good to uh, learn and uh, interact. Uh, and Lausanne is a nice city too. Uh, I took this picture uh, this morning, and uh, I saw the program. There will be a lot of uh, metal organic framework. So this will be the only thing close to it uh, in my talk. Um, I will rather talk to you about more macroscopic uh, things. That we we'll see what is macroscopic and microscopic, hopefully. So, um, the, at some point, I will come to confined systems and thermodynamics of confined systems, but there is a motivation for that, which is a paleoclimate reconstruction, because I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to work with uh, geoscientists who are very much interested into that. So, I will give a brief introduction about that part. And um, the samples we are using are fluid inclusions in minerals. I will come back to that soon. And some of them are uh, coming from evaporation of uh, salty water, as you can see here. So um, geoscientists are very much interested into the um, uh, past temperatures and past uh, composition of the atmosphere and try to produce uh, climate models to understand also what is going on nowadays. So they have a lot of uh, proxies, they call it, they call it uh, to, to get an idea of uh, the past uh, conditions. And most of them, they come from uh, the, the ocean or from polar ices. Um, so here you can see uh, time, and this goes as far back as uh, 800,000 uh, years back in time. And you see all these oscillations in different observables, for, for instance, this one here is a CO2 in red. Oops, so where is my pointer? It's here. <coughs> and so it goes up and down. So there are some uh, external forcing, like the orbital uh, forcing from the planet. Um, and it has a consequence on the temperature. So this is one, uh, this is the temperature anomaly from Antarctica. And you can see, uh, for instance, this is called the last interglacial stage. Uh, which was followed by an uh, icy uh, period. And the last one here is nowadays. It's another view here. So now it's a zoom from uh, uh, today to 200,000 years back. This is again at the top of the CO2 uh, record and some proxy for the temperature. Um, and so you see different interglacial stages. And so, of course, there was a the CO2, the CO2 rise uh, here. And we know there is a, another one right now for obviously different reasons, but it's important to try to understand the physics of uh, this uh, past period, maybe to make projection and uh, the, the future. But for this, we need to have good uh, information about the, uh, the temperature uh, in the past. And so it's hard to get on the continents. The proxies on the continents are um, less frequent, so, and most of the time they are indirect. So they can use, for example, um, uh, pollens from the flower and uh, uh, the different trees, etc. They can tell the type of climate, but uh, it's hard to get uh, an exact temperature out of that. And it's possible with a few uh, samples, which are free inclusions in minerals. So where do you find them? For instance, when you go to a cave, you may have uh, uh, stalagmites and stalactites. So they are called the uh, speleothem in the geoscience uh, language. And this is a, a cut of one of them. And if you zoom in, you see these uh, layers, which could because they grow uh, annually. And you can tell the edge of the, the spot in the speleothem. And inside these layers, you will find small fluid inclusions of the dripping water, which is trapped during the capsite uh, uh, crystallization. So the one I'm using with my colleagues is uh, not uh, speleothem at the moment, uh, is more evaporite. So evaporite is another type of um, mineral. It's a uh, uh, rock salt, for instance. Uh, and uh, uh, when a, a salt, um, uh, brine evaporates in the sun, at the end, it leaves small salt crystals, which may also contain 
a liquid droplet from the mother brine. And so we can recover them. And so we have worked in two uh, places in the world. Uh, one, uh, our, most, our favorite one is uh, the Dead Sea. But we have also a collaboration with uh, Tim Lovenstein uh, in the US, and uh, he worked on the uh, Death Valley. So, of course, uh, this is completely dry today, and you have a, a salt, uh, de salty desert. And this is still a lake, but it's drying fast, and uh, you, you have a lot of salt in it. So, this is a picture of the bottom of the Dead Sea. And uh, so you see salt is consistently uh, depositing at the bottom. And um, if you zoom in, you, you can see these uh, nice uh, coarse uh, crystals. And with a microscope, you can see these cubic inclusions. So they are cubic because uh, NACL has a cubic uh, symmetry. And uh, it's because of some intersection in the crystal growth, you may, you may trap the brine inside a cubic cell like this. And um, geoscientists are able to recover that. So they, some time ago, they, they had a big project to go and drill a, a, a core inside the bottom of the Dead Sea. And they were able, uh, like this, to uh, read 450,000 years of uh, the Earth's uh, history. And uh, there are alternation of different sediments. So the white area is a, a salty uh, deposit, but it's um, also um, stacked with uh, mud layers, depending on the, the degree of drought uh, in, the, in the area, because you have the Jordan River uh, pouring water there. And depending on the water balance, you may have a, a muddy period or a salty period. Uh, interestingly, so the last interglacial uh, is uh, in, in this uh, range. And this is also a time where there, are, there were some uh, humans uh, going uh, uh, from Africa to Europe. And you see that the, the Dead Sea uh, is on their way because you, you have to escape from this narrow uh, path. OK, so let's um, go to the physics of this uh, system. And so imagine you get one of these inclusions with a bubble in it. So you start at the liquid vapor equilibrium, and in the pressure-temperature plane, this would be a point on this binodal curve. If you warm up the system, the liquid will expand, and the bubble will shrink. And at some point, because it's a closed system, so this is my definition of confinement. Uh, we will see uh, other kinds of confinement later. But this is uh, the point here. I'm dealing with a closed system. And so at some point, the pressure gets so high that uh, all the liquid um, um, occupies the volume, uh, the vapor is completely condensed, and so you, um, you fill the box with a liquid. Uh, reading the temperature at which this happens, you may uh, um, get information, for instance, you know the density of the fluid inside, and so if the crystal was grown at uh, equilibrium with the, the, the vapor of the liquid above, when it closes, this happens exactly at this temperature. So the, the idea in geoscience is to say that uh, uh, what is called the homogenization temperature, that is the temperature at which the bubble disappears, Th, is equal to the temperature of formation of the crystal, Tx. And then your uh, inclusion looks like that. When you cool down, the bubble may not reappear right away. And this is interesting also because if you look here, you had a given volume with partly liquid and partly vapor. And now you have only liquid in the same volume. So it means that the liquid is now expanded. In fact, it can be uh, stretched to negative pressure. And this is one of my favorite topics. I do a lot of uh, experiments on that part to understand the properties of water and negative pressure. But I won't talk about that today. Uh, the important point here is that when you cool down, at some point, the tension gets so high that the liquid cannot remain metastable anymore, and it will break by cavitation, and you're back to the beginning with a bubble in equilibrium with its vapor. Okay, now this was uh, uh, to set the stage for the paleoclimate, but now let's go back to uh, thermodynamics. And um, 
one question behind is uh, how large can confinement be? We'll see that later. So, of course, you know that there should be equivalence in all the thermodynamic ensembles uh, in the thermodynamic limit, that is, for a big enough system. Uh, it should not matter if you are at constant volume or constant pressure. Here, you are at constant volume. And there is a well known phenomenon which is caused by surface tension. Uh, there will be a Laplace pressure difference between the liquid and, and the vapor because of the curvature in the bubble. And this causes a shift <coughs> of the equilibrium between the two phases uh, compared to the flat liquid vapor interface. So there has been a lot of work on that topic before, and uh, several groups have played an important role in that. So uh, Yves Kruger uh, uh, is among the geoscientists, and he, he was trying to understand uh, this effect to correct the data for geoscience, but also in physics and uh, physical chemistry. Uh, Willem Sen on one side, and also Olivier Vincent, who is here, <laughs> contributed to that uh, field. And so they, they all did um, uh, the thermodynamic model for that. But uh, uh, so one conclusion, one very interesting conclusion, is that there is a sizable effect even for inclusions as big as 10 microns. So this is confined, but not so much, okay, compared to the nanoscale. But still, we will see we have a quantitative shift of the temperature by a few uh, Kelvin. So it is measurable. And for the climate, of course, a few Kelvin matters. Um, and so <laughs> our contribution to that topic is uh, um, all this work were um, uh, more or less for a specific uh, problem. Uh, for instance, some were made for pure water, uh, although we have brine, uh, which may contain NaCl, but in the Dead Sea, you have also a lot of magnesium. So it may depend on the chemistry. And um, several uh, of them were based on uh, numerical resolution. So we try to improve that. And this led us to introduce a new length, which I call the Bertolo Laplace length. So why is that? So you have uh, Marcelin Bertolo uh, here, who was a pioneer of this uh, inclusion technique, not with uh, minerals, but with uh, test tubes sealed with a flame. He studied them. And of course, Laplace, uh, because of the Laplace uh, pressure. And so um, imagine, so let's. Do a textbook uh, calculation. Imagine you have a liquid droplet with radius Rd. You have the compressibility of the liquid written that way. The Laplace pressure is two times the surface tension to the radius. And so uh, the question I ask is what is the volume change due to surface tension? Because the compressibility is finite, you will have a change uh, of volume due to the excess pressure. And so if you introduce this length, so this is a length, two thirds of surface tension times compressibility, the, the answer is that the relative radius change is simply minus, I should use that. <laughs> it's not always easy, you see? So, yes, minus this length divided by the radius of the droplet. Okay, so how big is this effect? Lambda, the Bertolo Laplace length is very small, is only 20 picometer. So here you see it uh, for various temperatures. And at the top, you have pure water. And here you add NaCl. But typically, the size is 20 picometer. So, how could you get a sizable effect with such a small length? But we will see. So, of course, the volume effect on the droplet is extremely small. To see it, you would have to work with nano droplets. But it has an effect on the phase change. And so uh, the new idea there was to um, um, write a, a very simple equation of state. And so usually uh, you would uh, expand pressure as a function of density with a linear formula. But if you do that, you get logarithm in the chemical potential. And so I skip the technical details, but it was better to expand the chemical potential like this. So infinity relates to the bulk phase with a flat interface for surface tension. But here is for the bulk phase uh, at uh, equilibrium. Uh, so you have the density of the liquid at equilibrium with its vapor, for instance. And uh, so if you write this, then the pressure follows as a parabola. And so this is a pressure versus density at 20 Celsius for water. Um, the red dots are actually experimental work uh, that we perform because we, we are able to measure the pressure in, in so pure, pure water inclusions. 
Uh, and the blue uh, line is the fit, uh, is uh, this uh, simple expansion. And so you see, done to very large negative pressure, that is here you have uh, minus 100 megapascal, it does a really good job. And so with that, you can do the calculation. So this will be my, my uh, most uh, busy slide with mathematics. So let's go step by step. Uh, the inclusion is a cavity of volume uh, V. So by the way, it does not matter if the cavity is spherical or cubic or whatever, only the volume matters. But for simplicity, I called R the radius of the equivalent sphere having the same volume. You have a bubble in it with volume V in, in index paper, subscript, uh, subscript paper. And then you have the density row and uh, the question, because we are dealing with the NVT system, is to minimize the Helmholtz free energy, delta F. And so you need to write it there, taking into account the surface tension. Uh, so I work with reduced quantities. So uh, uh, the Helmholtz free energy delta F is rescaled by uh, kappa uh, over V, which gives a uh, dimensionless uh, uh, function phi. Uh, and also uh, we will see delta and X. So X is the ratio between the vapor volume and the cavity volume. And delta is the ratio, delta uh, naught is the, the ratio between uh, the um, average density and the density of the bulk liquid at equilibrium with its vapor. So when you use all that, you can rewrite the uh, Helmholtz free energy. So it has two contributions a surface term which scales like the volume to the two thirds, x to the two thirds here. And the other term is due to compressibility. So because what happens if you uh, have a low density, a low average density, if you fill the um, cavity with the liquid, it is under tension. So this is not the most, maybe not the most favorable case. But if you make a bubble up here, you're back to liquid vapor equilibrium, but you push the liquid uh, in the confined cavity and the pressure might increase. And you have to pay the price of the compressibility to compress the liquid there. So there is a trade-off between these two terms, and it's easier to see uh, 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 graphically. So X, remember, is the volume of the vapor, so it's the size of the bubble, typically. And uh, depending on uh, the uh, average density here, you will have different curves. So let's see. Um, yeah, maybe let's start with that one. If you are at really, really low uh, average density, you don't have much uh, matter in the cavity, it's okay to make a bubble. You have room for that. And so you have a stable bubble at this volume here. You have a minimum in the free energy. But now if you increase the average density, you have more and more molecules inside. At some point, you get here to the blue curve, which uh, is called equilibrium. So it's, as, uh, it's the same energetically speaking to have no bubble, that is x equals zero, or a bubble, they have the same free energy. If you increase the density a bit more, then the state with no bubble is more stable, even though the liquid is at negative pressure or at pressure below saturated vapor pressure, because the surface tension cost is too high. And it goes as far as making the bubble unstable. So there is a critical density at which the, minimum, the second minimum disappears because of an inflection point, and you cannot create any bubble. If there is a bubble, it will disappear, it will collapse right away. Okay, this is not new. Again, this was completely uh, explained in this previous paper, for instance, already in 2011. And uh, in this plot, it's nice also, you can see, so pressure versus temperature. For a flat interface, the liquid vapor equilibrium looks here like a horizontal line because the pressure change is very minor. But in the confined system, there is a Laplace pressure and the liquid vapor equilibrium is shifted to this line here, which ends <laughs> at the spinodal point. So let's uh, imagine uh, this. If you start here with a stable bubble at this point and you warm up the system, so the average density remains fixed uh, uh, inside the box, yes. But the, uh, when you divide it by rho L infinity, rho L infinity is the 
density of the liquid of the bulk liquid at equilibrium with this vapor, which is going down. So this delta is going up, and you may go from this state with a stable bubble to the state with an unstable bubble, which is the end point on that uh, curve. But so the new thing is that now with the simple equation of state we have used, we are able to solve everything analytically. Uh, um, in this uh, 2011 work was done numerically. And um, if you look here at the uh, Helmholtz, uh, oops. Let's see, yes, uh, Helmholtz free energy, this is um, a cubic equation for uh, x to the power one third. So you may solve that analytically. And we did it, but you may also extend because remember lambda is very, very small. And so x um, is related to the radius r and you introduce a small number epsilon, which is lambda, the Bertolo Laplace length, divided by the equivalent radius of the candidate. This is always very, very small in our experiments. And then you can make a simple expansion keeping only the leading term. And this does a perfect job. So you have the results here for uh, the volume x, the reduced volume of the bubble, and delta, the reduced average density. The blue line is for the equilibrium case when the bubble and no bubble has the same energy, they have the same energy. And the red line is when there is no bubble possible. This is a spinodal line. OK, so back to the geoscience problem. The application of that is when you look under the microscope and you warm up the bubble to find at which temperature it disappears, remember TH, the homogenization temperature. In fact, you don't get the one that you would get without surface tension. There is a, a gap between the two, a mismatch, um, which needs to be accounted for if you want to recover the actual temperature of entrapment of the, crystal, of the field inclusion in the crystal. And so this is the result. This is this quantity here. This is the, the bias between the observed homogenization temperature and the one which you would have without surface tension. And there, there, is a, uh, there are several curves, one, two, two, seven. This is the logarithm of the volume. So let's say uh, the curve three is um, an inclusion which would be 10 to the three micron to the cube. So it's 10 micron in size. And already for that, depending on the formation temperature, so you read it on the bottom axis, the direction might reach from minus one to minus uh, seven uh, Celsius. So it's not a small correction uh, regarding to the climate reconstruction. So it's really an effect that needs to be accounted for. Of course, so if you would use a smaller inclusion getting from to the nanoscale, you would have a much larger effect. And so this is also similar to the Gibson sun effect for melting in nanopores, etc. So the advantage of this uh, alternative approach is now it is uh, based only on the knowledge of lambda. All the information is condensed in lambda, which is two thirds of kappa gamma. So you just need to know the compressibility and the surface tension of the specific solution you are studying. So once you know, for instance, the composition of the Dead Sea, then you can calculate what is lambda and you can work out the correction. So, okay, this is theory. And the question is, does it work experimentally? And we do have results on that. And so this, uh, I will show you recent data taken by my former PhD student, uh, Emmanuel Guilherme, who is now a postdoc uh, in the uh, Tim Lovenstein uh, group. And so he went back to the Dead Sea. And so interestingly, as I said, the Dead Sea is evaporating quite fast. And so there, there are some uh, layers which were under uh, like 10 or 20 meters of uh, water in the 1980s, and they are now uh, in the air. And so you can go there, and with your hammer, you can collect uh, these uh, layers of salt and recover uh, small salt grains and look at the inclusions inside. And you can see, you see the uh, annual uh, valves uh, deposited during that period. And so 
all the points you can see here, they are the points he took. So he, 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 he studied uh, several infusions in each crystal and measured the homogenization temperature. And so let's have a let's zoom to see. So at the bottom, uh, you have the size of uh, the infusion. And this is the TH. So you see there is some scatter, but on average, you go to a temperature of 20 Celsius, and the standard deviation is one uh, degree. And uh, this is good because this is not, uh, you know, uh, dinosaur times. So it was monitored. The temperature at that time was monitored. So you can compare the results he obtained with the actually measured temperature inside the water body at the same time. And this is the result. So let's go through this side. Um, here, the black circles are the monitored uh, points. So you see, uh, during uh, the, the, the year, you have cooling and warming during summer and winter, basically. Uh, and you have an overall increase uh, of the average temperature. Actually, so global warming is a, a seen uh, throughout the, the decades in this uh, area. Uh, and so if you measure the homogenization temperature only, you get the empty symbols here. And you see there is like two, two degrees uh, difference systematically below the monitor temperature. But if you apply the correction due to surface tension, you are going up with the field symbols. And now they agree pretty well with the actually measured temperature. Also um, uh, consider that the monitoring is made uh, at discrete point in time and the crystal are going somewhere between two monitoring uh, uh, measurements. So yeah, there must be also some, uh, uh, some mismatch between, between the two, but uh, more or less it, you can see it. And it also captures the seasonal uh, alternation. Um, I won't talk about that today, but in fact, we, we worked on the very old samples and we were also able to capture this uh, seasonal alternation from the, uh, when you take a layer, you can look at the bottom or the top of the layer and you follow warming up of the, the, the water body during the process. Okay, there are other effects that are interesting uh, for the physicists. Uh, so, of course, you have a trivial uh, thermal expansion of the, the crystal, but okay, this is known for NACL, so you can include it. There is a more subtle effect, which uh, is that uh, uh, you have uh, in this uh, tiny cavity, diffusion is fast, and so you have always equilibrium uh, with the, uh, the salt around. So, because the solubility is, depends on temperature, the salt concentration is actually changing. And so some of the cavity is dissolving or, uh, inside the, the, the fluid inside, or if you put on it, may precipitate. And so the volume is changing due to that. But interestingly, when it does, so you would expect that the uh, overall density is decreasing. But because the ionic content is increasing, it compensates this effect. So the total density remains nearly constant. But anyway, you can also include that uh, completely in the model. And uh, we have done that, but uh, you, it's a limited impact. So it's, uh, for instance, you have a two degrees correction, maybe you would have only 0.1 or 0.2 degrees correction due to the other effects. But we are able to calculate. And so to end the talk, I will say this was a, you know, the ideal part. And in real life, it's a bit more complex. So first, you need a bubble for that to measure the CH. And most of the time, you don't have any bubble in the system. So you need to make the bubble appear. And the usual method is to put the sample, I mean, the geo geoscientists were putting all the samples in the freezer. And then they recover at room temperature and some infusions add a bubble, some add not. So why is that? It's because of metastability. So if you cool down along the isocore, the tension gets larger and larger. At some point, you may reach cavitation or not depending on the pressure and the impurities in the sample. And so when you do that, this is the result. In one sample, which was here, uh, uh, a synthetic sample grown at 41 Celsius, so they know at which temperature it was grown. 
and they could get any other temperature between minus one to uh, 41. And so this is a problem. Uh, the reason is when you put it in the freezer, you have plastic deformation of the host. And so you, you don't keep the same volume. And so you, you, you spoil your, your results. You spoil the, the temperature record. Uh, so one way to uh, get around that, by, uh, by, which was designed by Yves Kruger, um, who is now in uh, Oslo, um, he used the femtosecond laser to trigger uh, the cavitation. Uh, and so that works, but I won't, I will skip the details. Uh, and we have another method. And again, I will be very fast. We don't use a bubble anymore. And I will say how, so let me skip that. So we use brillant spectroscopy. So brillant spectroscopy is a spec um, light scattering technique. It's non-elastic, uh, inelastic uh, interaction between light and matter. And basically you measure a frequency shift of the light, which is proportional to the sound velocity in the medium over here, in the fluid inside the inclusion. We can focus the laser inside the inclusion because we have a spot with that is only one micron. So you get some spectra, and here you can see uh, when there is a bubble or no bubble, you, you see a change in the frequency shift because the, the sound velocity is different. <laughs> so the idea is to measure the sound velocity in an intact sample as a function of temperature. So this is done up there. Then you damage your sample voluntarily. You heat it up to very large temperature to expand it uh, plastically. And then it's easy to get a bubble when you cool down. And you measure again the sound velocity. And now you have a liquid vapor equilibrium in a, in a big inclusion. And when you combine the two curves, they cross. And we identify the crossing point as the uh, crystal growth temperature. And to convince you it works, this is an example of a synthetic crystal at grown at 33 Celsius. And this is our histogram. So you see it's much more narrow than the traditional method. And the average temperature is indeed very close to the uh, monitored growth temperature of 33. Okay, so I reached the conclusion. And uh, we have seen that surface tension is important in this process. We can summarize everything with one length, which is in the ten, tens of picometer scale. But it's still, um, uh, it makes sizable effect on 10 micron scale inclusions. Thank you. I think we have time for uh, one quick question, if you don't want to run too late. Uh, I'm interested in how you sample the natural crystals and right. Are these region specific, or how do you get the distribution in the end? So there was a, a core uh, the drill that at some point in the Dead Sea, you have not much choice, and also in the uh, Death Valley, it's a national park, so you have to go to the, the allocated spot. And then they have this uh, core that is cut in slices and kept in a big uh, cellar. And um, yes, you have, you have to, so they know the morphology because you have coarse crystals, fine crystals, you have mud. So they, they can uh, recognize you know, the part. And yet, then you have to make, um, to extract a, a thin uh, crystal. And you need to be careful because if you put too much shear on it, yeah. you may damage and change the volume of the inclusion. So well, some crystals with bubbles and some without. And so how do you- So most of the time they don't, have, the they don't have a bubble actually. This is one of the difficulty. They are metastable and they can stay because the pressure is not very negative. They can remain metastable on geological time. So you have to trigger the nucleation. And so the freezer thing is uh, you make a very large temperature change from 20 to minus 20. And so this is too big for the, the salt. It, it, it has plastic deformation. So you have to find other ways. Like, uh, try to can discuss that. Any other question? How do you exclude in geological times that there hadn't been uh, uh, plastic deformation during yeah, it's a good question. I, of course, there are many uh, scientific questions. Uh, you can have also dissolution and reprecipitation later in time, but they, these they are able to tell because you have growth bands. So the cubic crystal grows in the layers, and the inclusion parallel to those layers are, are uh, good. And so some other inclusions are bad, so you can tell the difference. But I would say the answer is that the geosynthesis they like multi proxy. So if you have another way of uh, independent way of telling the story, it's better. We did that with Tim Lovenstein. In the mud layers, 
they can analyze some uh, branch visceral uh, stuff, which is made by microorganisms, and they have a calibration for the temperature on, uh, on this basis. And when you put the two together, so you have alternation of salt, mud, salt, mud, you can have a trend which is consistent. So I think this is a better answer is to, to have uh, several proxies. Thank you. Okay, let's thank. <laughs>